On this week's episode of Weather or Not, we have nature in the news stories, focusing on volcanoes and food waste. Colby has a feature on severe thunderstorm activity, and Drew has your upcoming weekend forecast. Don't go away. Weather or Not starts right now. Well, welcome to another episode of Whether or Not. I am your host, Allie DeBicke. And I'm your forecaster, Drew Narsutis. Well, Drew, this week sparked the first day of meteorological spring here in Pennsylvania and across the northern hemisphere, but we're starting to see a change here for uh, the weekend. Yes, uh, indeed. The temperatures, which had been much above average the last couple of weeks, are going to be settling down into seasonable and getting a little bit under our, what we normally see for this time of year. However, it will be a change later on in the week. Right, especially when those students are leaving for their spring break, what should they expect as they well, head out of the state? The good news is that leaving the state this weekend should be fairly mild. Temperatures are going to be working out and not much to talk about as far as precipitation. However, if you do leave the central Pennsylvania area, you are going to be missing out on some interesting weather early next week. Well, Drew will have more in his upcoming forecast, but for now, let's go to Nature in the News. When it comes to a changing climate, growth of feathered populations is at risk. Migratory birds rely on their biological clocks to guide them from when to arrive to and depart from breeding grounds. A warming climate can result in a cascade of environmental changes that can damage the mating process. Arriving to less than ideal conditions at their breeding grounds can reduce the reproductive success of many bird populations. This is including the golden eagle, greater sage grouse, and Allen's hummingbird. Guatemala's Fuego volcano has erupted in dramatic fashion, sending columns of ash four miles into the sky. No evacuations were ordered due to Sunday night's volcanic activity, but officials asked nearby communities to remain vigilant and not come out into contact with the ash cloud. The nearby Volcanic Research Institute said that the mountain produced a constant sound very similar to a train locomotive, and it rattled roof and windows 18 miles away. The National Disaster Response spokesman David DeLeon said on Monday that particulate matter was falling in at least eight nearby towns. The eruption which began last week has intensified over the recent days, creating some striking images. But this event is nothing new to Guatemala. No, this volcano has erupted 13 times last year. Did you know between 30 to 40 percent of food goes uneaten in the United States? Producing and transporting food from the farm to our tables requires the use of enormous amounts of energy, land, and water. When food is thrown away, the natural resources that are used for growing, processing, packaging, transporting, and marketing the foods are also wasted. Important steps that individual consumers can take to reduce the amount of food they throw away can include being more careful shoppers, using better methods to store and reuse leftovers, serving smaller portions, and composting. Chicago will go through an entire January and February without so much as an inch of snow on the ground for the first time in recorded history. And you thought the Cubs winning a World Series was strange. According to the National Weather Service in Romeoville, Illinois, Christmas morning was the last day O'Hare National Airport reported at least an inch of snow on the ground. This has not occurred since records began in 1871. The winter started out impressively snowy in Chicago, with 17.7 inches of snow falling in the two weeks from December 4th to the 18th, more than double the average for the entire month. Then, the snow essentially shut off. Since December 18th, O'Hare Airport has measured a pathetic 0.6 inches of snow total. Average snowfall in Chicago from December 18th to the end of February is about 23.4 inches. Meanwhile, February has been one of the warmest on record. Two of the five 70 degree plus February days on record at O'Hare occurred within a three day span on February 18th and 20th.
Welcome to your Central Pennsylvania forecast. I'm student meteorologist Drew Narsutis. Why don't we jump right into the weather and quite a jump we are seeing as most of this map on Friday is covered in snow. This is due to a uh, clipper system that was in this Midwest on Thursday and tracked its way into Central Pennsylvania on Friday, bringing with it a light dusting of snow to the north of it. Uh, unfortunately, this is all the precipitation we're going to be seeing this weekend here in Central Pennsylvania. As on Saturday, two systems of high pressure make their way into the area just off to the south of us here in State College. Uh, there's some good news and some bad news with this. The good news is that this high pressure is going to allow some peaks of sunshine to come through those clouds. Only bad news is that these high pressure systems like to whip wind around them in a clockwise rotation, which will bring a lot of cold air from Canada into our Commonwealth and make temperatures a little bit colder than what we should be seeing this time of year on Saturday. Good news is that on Sunday, this double high pressure system thing sort of works in our favor as it tracks more to the east and all this cold air from Canada is going to be settling around here. However, we are going to be getting a lot of warm air flooding in from the south. It's going to be coming uh, or clockwise around the high pressure and into the Commonwealth for Sunday. And as this high pressure is in the area, we're getting warmth and sunshine. So just a great end to our weekend there. Uh, let's look at our weekend recap again one more time. Friday, 31 degrees outside. This clipper system is going to be coming through, bringing with it most models are expecting a little bit under a quarter of an inch, so nothing to worry about having to shovel. However, if you are leaving your car outside and do have to commute to work, you might want to leave an extra two or three minutes to sort of brush the ice and snow off of your car that will accumulate on Friday. Friday night, not the night, best night to be outside. 16 degrees outside, cold and cloudy. Only good news is that the winds aren't going to be too strong on Friday, so we won't see unbearable wind chill on Friday night. Moving on to Saturday, we have 31 degrees, so that high pressure system does bring in some sunshine. However, the winds out of the north are going to be keeping our temperatures barely under freezing. It will be sunny though with some clouds in the area, and this temperature will be increasing quite a bit on Sunday, three to four degrees. Um, above average temperature for us as at 45 on a Sunday. Warmth will flood in from the south and we'll have a beautiful, beautiful end to our weekend here in central Pennsylvania. Anyway, let's go on to Kobe's feature on severe weather. They say that March comes in like a lion and severe thunderstorms certainly meet this criteria. The roar of the thunder is just one feature that accompany this amazing phenomenon. We're gonna get an in-depth look at how severe thunderstorms form what conditions are favorable for them to form, and how they are forecasted, and what makes them different in forecasting other types of weather. Severe thunderstorms are unique specimens in the study of meteorology. One of the reasons is because they are capable of causing excessive damages to property and life that you may expect from hurricanes, but within a much shorter time period. Flash floods, lightning, damaging winds, hail, tornadoes, these phenomena represent the threats that severe thunderstorms can bring to a given area. So how do these severe thunderstorms form, and what conditions are favorable for their production? For that answer, we'll turn to Dr. Paul Markowski, a meteorology professor here at Penn State who specializes in the study of severe thunderstorms. The main ingredients for thunderstorm formation are humidity and heat near the ground and relatively cool air aloft and the reason those ingredients are important is because you need air to become warmer than its surroundings when it's lifted and if you start with air that's already warm and humid near the ground it's easier for that air to become uh, warmer than its surroundings when it's lifted. The, the fancy word for this is buoyancy. Uh, and then that's just thunderstorms in general. To get severe thunderstorms, in addition to those other ingredients, you also have to have a lot of what's called wind shear, which is when the wind changes a lot, either in speed or direction or both with altitude. Due to their smaller size when compared to low pressure systems, the study of severe thunderstorms requires more precise research and analysis from meteorologists of various backgrounds. Dr. Markowski explains what his specific research focuses on. So my research is in convective storms, thunderstorms, and, and the hazards that go with them. In particular, tornadoes, which is what my lifelong interest in science has always been. So uh, yeah, study how tornadoes form, how they're maintained, how they dissipate, how we can predict them better. But improving predictions always starts with getting a better understanding of the physics. 
So uh, we don't get better forecasts by sit, having people sit around in a circle deciding, okay, how do we get it? How do we better make predictions? It starts with understanding how they work. So there's a lot of uh, bare bones uh, math and theory, and we can use computer simulations for some of our work. And sometimes uh, we need to go out into the field and get observations too with radars or other instruments. The spontaneity of severe thunderstorms coupled with their hazardous potential makes it that much more important to accurately forecast and track the development of these storms. But what challenges exist in forecasting severe thunderstorms compared to other kinds of weather? Dr. Markowski weighs in on this inquiry. One of the things that makes severe storms, severe thunderstorm forecasting fundamentally different from forecasting tomorrow's high temperature, whether or not it will rain tomorrow, is the fact that storms are relatively localized. So these are not actually resolved in our forecasting simulations. Our forecasting simulations are really good at resolving things that are very large in scale, things that are, when I say large in scale, I mean hundreds of miles, sometimes a thousand miles across. But thunderstorms are much more localized, a few miles across. And because we can't explicitly see them in our forecasting models, we can really only forecast whether conditions can support the storms. And the problem is, is that just because you have conditions that support storms doesn't mean that you'll get storms. The conditions are a necessary but insufficient condition to get the actual thunderstorms. Dr. Markowski's expertise offered us a glimpse into what goes into studying severe thunderstorms. While the guidance of weather models continues to improve, we still need the efforts of people like Dr. Markowski and his research team to help us truly understand, and thus more accurately forecast, the development and movement of severe thunderstorms. With experts such as Dr. Markowski working on solving the puzzle of severe thunderstorms, and new improving technology such as the Gozar satellite come into play, the accuracy of forecasting severe thunderstorms has nowhere to go but up. For whether or not, this is Colby McCabe. Welcome to your extended forecast, everybody. Before we talk about our extended forecast, why don't we look at our weekend recap, which we can start off with on Friday, the clipper system that came through the area, bringing with it a light dusting of snow and temperatures just below freezing. However, going into Saturday, this, we did have a high pressure system come into the area, which brought a lot of cold air from the north into the Commonwealth. Thus, our temperature didn't really get much above freezing as well this day as these winds impeded any warming. However, because of the high pressure, we did have some peaks of sunshine and this high pressure really built into Sunday as we see the uh, winds came out of the south instead of the warmth on Sunday which made our warm our air much warmer on Sunday and we did have that sunshine in the air thanks to the high pressure system and uh, this high pressure system is going to be going away but the temperatures sure aren't they're going to be increasing Monday into Tuesday we have very very above average temperatures for this time of year usual average temperatures are like 41 42 and we're seeing possibly up to 58 on Tuesday however as we move Tuesday into Wednesday a storm system comes through with a pretty strong cold front taking a lot of moisture and warmth out of the atmosphere as we see it dip down to about average on Wednesday and then Thursday and Friday Friday, this, as the system moves off, we do have some sunshine to help sort of warm our air, and we could be seeing temperatures above average again moving on to later on this week. Well, Drew, thank you so much for that forecast. It looks like a lot of rain is moving in midweek here in State College. You're very right. It will be a very wet and warm early midweek coming up, so bring your umbrellas out of hiding and keep an eye out for a possible a lightning strike here or there on Tuesday and Wednesday. All right. Well, we asked you earlier on in the show, Wednesday was the start of meteorological spring. What are the meteorological seasons based on? Is it A, Earth's orbit location, B, precipitation amounts, C, temperature, or D, Puxatawney Phil? 
if you guess C, you are correct. While the astronomical seasons are based on Earth's position in its orbit around the sun, meteorologists break the seasons down into groupings of three months. And this is based on the annual temperature cycle in relation to the calendar. You're very correct there. Summer is the warmest three months, winter is the warmest or the coldest three months, and then spring and fall are the transitional three months. Yes, and unfortunately, we're going to have to transition to the end of our show here for this week. I'm your host, Allie Debicki. And I'm your forecaster, Drew Narsutis. Have a great weekend.